and we are live what is up everyone welcome back to hack smarter my name is tyler i am your host and in this stream we are going to dive in and do some try hack me now if you're new to my stream i don't prep things ahead of time this is just me working through the material giving my thoughts giving my feedback and also getting stuck and stumbling through it and doing this together so the room i want to begin with don't know if this is the only room we'll do maybe we'll do a challenge room after this but try hack me has a new room called cactus which is a full walkthrough of CVE 2022-46169, which we will get into that if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's totally fine. I will share my screen and we will go through it together. And I will say this is a completely free room. So even without a TriHackMe subscription, you are welcome to boot this up yourself and follow along and to make it even more approachable to those who might be new to ethical hacking or try hack me i'm going to use the in browser attack box so i'm not even using my vm and the attack box is available to everyone i know there are some limitations for free users to be honest i don't remember what those limitations are i do have a vip plan and would encourage it with the vip plan you get unlimited attack box and it's connected to the internet so things just work a little bit uh, smoother for you but without any further ado let me go ahead and share my screen we have the room here at my attack box right here, which is uh, Ubuntu instance in the cloud that we're able to do hacking on. I, it works for all of the Try Hack Me rooms. Let me get the chat pulled up on the side, make sure I'm not missing anything. Actually going to split my screen between LinkedIn and Twitch over here. There we go, that should work. Actually, no, that won't work, hold up. <laughs> Let me do this and I was trying to do the split screen view, but it was a little bit buggy. I couldn't actually refresh LinkedIn and because LinkedIn is silly, I can't see comments unless I refresh it, but there we go. Got everything working. So uh, special welcome to all of you joining. Let's go ahead and dive into this. And if you've never done these rooms with me before, we're going to read it in this entirety. I think when we do uh, guided rooms, our tendency is to rush through it, to skim the material, and then we're not really learning. And guys, when it comes to try hack me or hack the box or ports of your academy, the goal isn't to finish. Like honestly, the goal is not to even get root on a machine. The goal is to learn. So if you just rush through or look at a walkthrough right away, you're not learning. You may root the machine or whatever, but you're not learning. And that is the end goal to learn something new as we do this. Have not done this room, have heard good things about it. And I personally want to understand the CVE a little bit better. Maybe I'll encounter it in the real world. So let's go ahead and learn about it. So last December of 2022, a security advisor was released regarding a critical vulnerability affecting all Cacti versions before 1.2.3. The vulnerability, branded as CVE 2022-46169, has been assigned a CVSS score of 9.8, that's high, indicating its critical severity. This high rating stems from the potential for malicious actors to exploit an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability, thereby enabling unauthorized access to affected systems. It really doesn't get much worse than that. Cacti is an open source network monitoring and graphing tool designed to collect, store, and present time series data in a graphical format. Different orgs commonly use it to monitor and analyze the performance and utilization of network devices, servers, and other IT infrastructure components. Given the number of users of this application, it was observed that many vulnerable Cacti instances were exposed in public and threat actors have been utilizing this vulnerability to compromise these assets. So connect to the machine. I went ahead and started my attack box. It says starting the virtual machine in split screen view. Oh, we can do split screen or we can connect via SSH. We'll just do it via SSH right here. So we'll do SSH user at 10.10.53.105. Yes. And try hack me as our password. All right, so we are logged in. You will need a machine to emulate the exploitation of vulnerable cacti instances. So you may start the attack box VM, which we already have it here. We'll just open a new tab and we'll just name this one SSH. And this one we'll just name our terminal. For a quick overview here, the service is running the attached virtual machine. So we have SSH running on port 22. We have our vulnerable Cacti instance running on port 80, so a web server. And we have Kibana instance running on port 5601 for investigation via the SIM. So we must be able to do both red team and blue team, which will be fun. 
Important, while the web browser, I Chromium, might immediately start after boot up, it may show tabs that have connection refuse displayed. This is because the elastic stack takes a few more minutes to finish starting up after the VM has completely booted up. Please walk through the task and exploitation with the attack box, and Cabana should be ready by the time you reach task 5. Alright, and let's just see what this looks like, so we'll get this pulled up. Give it a second, check out the chat, make sure I'm not missing anything, which I'm not, cool. I still see a login screen or anything? Oh, there we go. Apparently it said I got a cacti. So we have a username and password. All right, so our first exploitation is the authentication bypass. Let's check this out. So the CVE allows an attacker to bypass authentication and execute arbitrary code remotely on the affected system. This vulnerability specifically affects Cacti version 1.2.22, released on August 18th, 2022. And we can see, hey, there's our version information right there. The vulnerability is present in the remote agent PHP file, which has a function to retrieve IP addresses and verify an entry within the polar table. If an entry is found, the function returns true and the client is authorized. Over on LinkedIn, Sylvia said, good evening. Good evening, Sylvia. It is still afternoon for me, but it's almost evening. So, hey, thank you for taking the time to hang out. We are doing the cactus machine on Try Hackman. So what is the vulnerability? Well, the remote agent.php file is designed to be accessed solely by authorized clients. To ensure this, an authorization verification is implemented at the start of the file. So here we go. If remote client authorized, so if it's not, if, there, if it's not true, print fatal. You're not authorized to use a server and exit. So it's checking, hey, is they authorized? And if not, print this error. The remote client authorized function is used to obtain the client's IP address, convert it to a corresponding host main, and verify if this host name is present in the polar table. So here's that function. So we have our client address, and we're running this. Hey, go ahead and click the, get the client address. Client name, get host by address by the client address. So we're taking that and putting it in there and getting the host name and then polar so we're doing a database fetch here so select everything from polar so get all the data from the polar database and now we're doing a for loop for each polar as polar so it's just going through all the data there if the remote agent is just stripping out white spaces if the remote agent is in the host name so basically all this checking is hey is the host name in the polar database and if so it can authenticate if not print this error this code snippet above illustrates that the get client address function is used to fetch the client's IP. This function considers several HTTP headers that can be manipulated by attackers when determining the IP address. So we have this, get client address. So how is it doing that? Well, we're getting it from address headers and I can already see the issue here. Uh, these are all available, all of these actually, are available to an attacker to modify. And what I often do on a web app pen test is I'll use Oh, what's it called? It's a burp suite plugin or extension, I should say. It's essentially a parameter hunter. It will fuzz all these different parameters and tell you which ones are available. And you might be able to bypass some restrictions by using these. And just looking at the code, we can see, hey, you don't want to verify the client address based on something an attacker can control because then of course we can modify that ourselves. Client address equals false for each, so another for loop. So it's just using those headers in there. While the remote address variable is assigned the source IP address, I'm gonna zoom in on this for you guys a little bit, is assigned the source IP address from the connection to the web server, a variable starting with HTTP are filled with corresponding HTTP headers received from the client. So all of these can be modified by an attacker. These values can be completely controlled by attackers, like I just said, unless there's an instance between the client and the web server like a reverse proxy that filters these HTTP headers. Referring back to the previous code snippet, the polar table includes a default entry with the host name of the server running Cacti. As a result, attackers can circumvent the remote client authorized verification by, for instance, supplying the HTTP header X forwarded for. In this scenario, the get client address function returns the IP address of the server running Cacti. The get host by address call then converts this IP to the server's host name, which will pass the polar host name verification due to the default entry. I see, so we're just gonna do X forwarded for and make it look like we are the server, if I'm understanding this properly. 
So how to bypass authentication checks on this endpoint? The authentication can be bypassed by manipulating the X forwarded for value to match an entry within the polar table. Because remember, it was just going through the polar table, that for loop in there. Oh, uh, let's see. This will cause the function to return true, authorizing the client. So without the X forwarded, you are not authorized to use the service. And with it, it allows us to go do. Note, the value of the X forwarded for might change depending on the target. All right, what is the HTTP header used to bypass authentication on the remote agent? X forwarded for. So we must go through the theory and then I'm guessing we might exploit this at the end. What up AZ Cowboy one over in YouTube? Good to have you here, my friend. All right, command injection. The command injection vulnerability is also present in the remote agent.php file. It is specifically associated with the polar item and its action parameter. So vulnerability on parameters of remote agent.php. As per the injection flow described, the user provided parameter polar ID is passed to the first parameter of proc open without any sanitization or escaping. This leads, of course, to a command injection vuln in the pull for data function. Attackers can exploit this by setting the action parameter to pull data. So let's see if we can understand this. So we have this get request variable action. So was this what is attacker controlled? Attacker can do anything there and it's not sanitizing it? Initially, the pull for data function fetches, fetches the parameters host ID and polar ID. However, there's a crucial distinction. The host ID parameter is obtained from git filter request var, while the polar ID parameter is derived from git and filter request var. Note the extra n character there. Right there. Drink of water. While the git filter request variable function ensures that the fetch parameter is an integer, the git and filter is going to be a string, which is used to fetch a polar ID, allows any strings. And that's what that n is specifying there if you're new to that. Continuing along the injection flow, we observe that polar items are fetched from the database. If the action of one of these items is set to polar action script PHP, the vulnerable call the proc open is made. Hold on, let me read it again. Continue along the injection flow, we observe that polar items are fetched from the database. If the action of one of these items is set to that, the vulnerable call the proc open is made. All right. So for each item as item, so our for loop, switch item action case polar action script, cacti PHP proc open. Okay, so there's our dangerous function there. This implies that attackers can use the polar ID parameter to inject any command when an item with the polar action script PHP action exists. This is highly probable in a production instance as this action is added by some predefined templates like device uptime or device polling time. So it's not just random, like it's gonna be there. To make the database query return such an item, the attacker must provide the corresponding ID. Given that the IDs are numbered in ascending order and hundreds of IDs can be sent in a single request by providing an array, attackers can easily find a valid identifier. So checking for a valid host ID and local data IDs. Using Burp Suite Intruder, click the plus sign. How many are we going to do? Oh, just 20. Okay. I know the community edition of Burp Suite Intruder is right limited. So I want to see if I had to pull out my magical Kato, but we'll follow what the room is talking about. So to do that, we'll go ahead and just open Burp Suite right here. If you want to follow along. temporary project and it just wants us to paste this in so we're not actually doing the request and then capturing it we're literally just going to get repeater to, to grab this we'll do later here all right and if we pull up our browser what I'm going to do is we'll just turn on burp go back to burp Okay, intercept is on, beautiful. And we'll just do this. Capture this with burp. Go ahead and send that to repeater. And it says, hey, just copy this and make sure you have two blank lines at the end. And let's like actually understand what this is doing. I do. Can I move this to the other side of my screen? Yeah, okay. 
So we're doing get cacti remote agent. Our action is pull data and local data IDs. Oh, th so we need to send this to intruder. My bad. That's what those uh, weird things are. It's saying, hey, we want you to modify this number right here and this number right here. And so those are already specified. And then we are going to go ahead and select the target at that, which we already do. Attack type of cluster bomb. Now there's different attacks here. So sniper is using a single set of payloads or one or more payload positions. It places in the first position, then the second position, etc. What we are going to do is cluster bomb. So it uses multiple payload sets. We're going to set two different payload sets because that looked like there's only two things set. So it goes through all of these in turn. So let's do cluster bomb. I do think there are just two payloads there. So if we go to payload, you can see, well, let me just set this manually. I don't know if these are messing it up. So we're going to do it ourselves. So if we just highlight the one there and click add, then it should see our two positions. Yep. Now we have the two positions. That's what I was looking for. Insert a new payload marker to the value of host ID and local IDs, which we did. Okay, and configure the payload to the below settings. Click the payload set to one, which is fine. And we're gonna change this over to numbers. And we're gonna do num number range from one to 20 with a step of one, just which just means one, two, three, four, five, six. In a number format, minimum integer digits of one, of course, and maximum two. And then change the th same thing with our payload set. Remember, we have two payload sets here, so if you do the same steps, so we'll go numbers from one to 20, one there. Click the start attack button to monitor the results with the length tab to sort the request by largest to smallest. And see, oh, there's 400 payloads. Guys, I'm, I think we might break out Kato, although this won't take super long. But we could go install Kato just to the attack box. That might be fun. And I can show you guys how much faster this would be in Kato. But it's not going to take too terribly long. Ah, screw it. Let's show you guys Kato. Forget Burp Sweet Community Edition. Let's discard all of this. Let's see if we can do this with Kato. <laughs> Sound good, guys? Sound good. Sounds good to me. And I'll even show you how to install Kato. So if you're new to Kato, I'll walk through the full install process here. So here's Kato, a web security auditing toolkit built from the ground up in Rust. Let's go ahead and download the CLI for Linux. Once we download that, we will open up our terminal, which we already have. And we'll do tar xf kato. That'll give us the kato binary. If we echo our path, we can suit. Well, we're already root, so we don't have to suit up. But we can move kato, and we'll just move it to user local bin. And now we'll just rename this to kato. Log in. Stop sharing my screen just for a moment while I log into my Kato instance. Now you do have to have an account, but it is free. I do have a uh, paid account because I really like Kato. But it's really affordable for that pro account. All right, we got Kato pulled up. We'll click next here to set up our new project. Just walking us through the basic steps to do. So we will create a project and we will call it Cactus. Uh, we'll just 
just happen. This attack box not like my Kato instance. I just did all this. Alright, and what we need to do... is get the Kato cert. Which usually it prompts us for it, but I think because I have the split screen, it, it broke that way. I think if we go here, yeah, CA certificate, we'll download the certificate, beautiful, and then we'll load it into Firefox, just like we do with Burp. We'll go to settings, cert, view certificates, import, CA cert. Okay. Now we're ready to rock. So if we go to intercept, forward, turn burp on, we have it right there. Beautiful. So we have it going well. And it looks like we're going to send this over to automate. And we'll just take the same request that we had before, which is this one right here with two spaces on the bottom just so it's proper syntax. So we'll just add one more new tab there and we'll go ahead and remove these and we'll add them ourselves. Mark. Mark. I think those are the two if I remember right. Oh, so here's something I actually haven't messed with is the attack strategies in here. I wonder which one corresponds to cluster bomb. So one feedback to Kata would be uh, Burp does a nice job of giving like, hey, here's what these different attack ones are. I'm not quite sure what these different ones mean. Let's see if we can understand it. Worst case scenario, I'll go back to uh, Burp, but more fun to try Kato out. Okay, so sequ sequential. This will replace markers one at a time. If you have multiple markers, only one will replace. Okay, so that's like Sniper and Burp. All oh, this will replace all the markers with the same value. Is that sort of like Matrix or not Matrix Cluster Bomb? This replaces all the markers of different values and the different payloads. This will replace all the markers of the combination of payloads. Payloads can have different number of elements, but where this can create a large number of requests. Okay. I think we're looking for all, maybe? A different payload set for each defined position. Payloads are placed from each set in turns so that all payload combinations are tested. For example, the first three requests would be request one, position one, first payload from set two, position two, first payload from set two. So all would work the same because we're doing the same payloads in both, right? From one to 20. At least in my head, that, that seems just fine if we do it that way. Make sure I'm not missing the chat. What up, Timothy? Rivera saying good afternoon. Good to have you here, my friend. So I think all might work, but guys, I'm really going into ground that I haven't messed around with. So we'll see what happens. I'll show you the other cool thing about Kato. We have assistant here. So if we say like, give me a short bash script that just outputs numbers from one to 20. All right, so we can even do that if we suck at bash scripting. Kato can help us out with that. Simple for loop, obviously. And I think we can just paste this into Kato. Can I not paste? I guess not. 
So that would be other feedback for our Cato team. If anyone actually watches this, it would be nice to be able to just paste. All right, now let's give it a shot. So that's all it's doing, right? 1 to 20. All will do it in both. That seems to be right to me. Actually, let's do this. Let's speed it up. And then it wants us to sort it by length, right? Click the link tab to sort the request by largest to smallest. Oh, I don't have 400 requests here, but I suppose that makes sense. Okay, I might just have to go back to burp, guys. I don't really... If I understood the attack better, I'd know what it's looking for. This doesn't look quite right to me. I also don't have the length of 813. Let's play around a little bit more before we switch back to burp. If I do... Parallel. Still only 20 requests, and we do have that there. <laughs> this is why you should just follow the instructions and not try to be neat and do weird tools. Um, let's try Matrix just for fun. And now we're getting more requests, at least. <laughs> Maybe that's what we needed in Kato was Matrix. Maybe that's the equivalent to Cluster Bomb and Burp Suite. You guys see how much faster these requests are going through, though? I don't really understand what I'm looking for. The number in the payload one tab is a value that works in the local data IDs parameter. The number in the payload two tab is a value that works in the host ID parameter. What should the response look like? Yo, what up, Ben? Good to have you here. We're, we're going through ca the cactus room. But I'm trying to do it in a very weird way and use Kato instead of Burp Suite <laughs> because of the uh, the rate limit restriction on uh, Burp Suite Community Edition. But I don't, I don't, <laughs> I'm not good enough at Kato to understand what I'm doing properly. I'm trying to replicate this. All right, guys, we might just switch back over to Burp. Uh, I'm just impatient with the 400 uh, requests let's do this you guys can look at my face for a second I'm gonna pull up parrot because I have burp suite pro on it and we'll we'll do this in burp suite pro it would have been done by now if I just like didn't mess around and uh play around with Kato instead of just following the try hack me task. We would have been done a long time ago. Yeah, Ben, so I try to use Kato uh, when I'm streaming. Like at work, I still use Burp Suite Pro, of course, but I got feedback from people when I was streaming like, hey, I don't have Burp Suite Pro and I can't do your automate type stuff. Uh, or not, it would be intruder on Burp 
without rate limiting. So then I discovered Kato, which doesn't have any rate limiting, and it looks a lot prettier than like OWASP's app. So I've been using that just when I'm on stream. Guys, I lost my mouse. Here it is. All right, I'm almost back to sharing my screen, y'all. Thanks for your patience. You don't really have a choice, though. Here we go. Oh, do I not even have the Try Hack Me VPN on this machine? We have to go get that. Let's fix that real quick. Log in. One second. Yeah, it's written in Rust from the ground up. And, and honestly, it works really well. Uh, like the main things I use is automate from it. Of course, it has its own version of like repeater and uh, then it has a chat GPT like pulled into, into it for web app security. So a little less restricted than your normal chat GPT. It helps you with reverse shells and things like that. So it works well for the most part, but it's definitely still in development. But I've been able to solve most try hack me and hack the box rooms using just Kato. I don't usually have to switch over to burp. But because this is a walkthrough room and it's specifically asked to use burp, I couldn't figure out the right like cluster bomb attack in Kato, which is the issue. that and I think I might have to do the VPN fix looking up the command real quick whoops don't want to open that okay well let's just try it Yeah, so I get stuck in this loop. Anyone remember the the key to fixing that? We just we just have to add the right cipher if I remember right. Can I just do this? No. I think we can just add it this way. Oh, Pluma Tenebrae. Where do I add it at? I remember before I just did it in the terminal, but there was a a post on the Try Hack Me forum <laughs> that had the the command to do it, and the Try Hack Me forum just redirects now to Discord. I suppose I could find it on Discord, but if anyone knows, let me know. I fixed this many times, but I don't remember the exact syntax. Oh, do I just need to change ciphers to data ciphers? Yeah, Ben, you're right. I think that might be all it is. Is that all it is? Nope. Let me get rid of that. Yeah, cool. That's all I had to do. Beautiful. All right, now we're on the VPN. And we have our machine going here. So we'll throw that to the side. Throw this to the side. Apparently Kato doesn't want to snap, or not Kato, Burp doesn't want to snap to the side, so I'll manually throw it to the side then. And I don't even think I have the Burp, oh no, I do have the Burp thing installed. Well, let's check. B 
be helpful if I turn this on. Okay. Did I already install it then? We'll eventually complete this room, guys, and my weird way of going around uh, the right way you're supposed to do it and ended up right back at the right way you're supposed to do it. All right, so let's go ahead and capture just a request here. We'll turn on intercept. We'll send that over to intruder, and then we'll follow the actual steps here. We need to just copy this. like that and then those are already marked beautiful we'll just change our payload over to cluster bomb and we'll do payloads one that's fine numbers from 1 to 20 minimum digits that same thing for payload two numbers 1 to 20 by steps of one minimum digit just like that we have our two spaces start attack Still not going the fastest, but it's going faster. We'll just let it do its thing, and we'll read ahead to understand exactly how we're going to use this information. So it says, since we already validated that there are valid host ID and local data ID, so that's all we're doing right now is figuring out the right local data ID and host ID, right? 15.1, and hey, I may have actually discovered that on Cato. That may have been actually the, the ones that had the highest length on Kato. But you guys can see even Kato is faster than Burp Suite Pro at, at this process right here. So since we have already validated there are valid host ID and local ID from the previous task, we can automate the RCE using this exploit. Before running the exploit, change the line 26 of the code from X4 to F local cacti IP to X4 to 4 so it looks like it's coming from local host. Below is the sample modified code. And let's see if we can read through this code a little bit, understand what's going on before we just blindly script kitty it. Probably turn off a uh, proxy would be a good place to start. So here's the RCE. It's of course a Python script. We're just importing random and HTTPX and URL libraries to process the HTTP request. So here's just the port information and here's a cacti local IP. Here's what we're gonna modify. And then we're doing a very basic bash reverse shell. It's going to ask us for our L host and our L port. And it's going to base 64 encode it, I suppose, for safe characters. Giving us a random user agent. And then our arguments, right? We have a URL, the target URL, the remote port, all that stuff. And then we're just updating the headers for the X forwarded for is the only change that we have to make to it. So let's do that. I believe that's the only change we need to make. If we go back over to Cactus. Once you modify the code, start an NC listener with your desired NC listener port. In the below example, we are using 443. The attacker IP is, of course, our attack box IP or our VPN IP if you're using your VM. An attacker machine listening port is the netcat listener port. Once done, run the exploit code by using the command below. 10.13.4.234. So we'll do the same thing. We'll have to sudo it. See if our exploit works. Oh, I need to put that in um, in uh, quotes. Just single quotes. Let's fix that real quick. Save it. Now see if that works. Beautiful. So all we're doing is our exploit will specify our URL. 10.10.53.105 slash cacti 
dash i is our IP address, which I already forgot what it was. Our ton zero right there. Go ahead and grab that. And then, of course, our dash p port, which is 443, is what we're listening on with our netcat listener right there. And let's, fingers crossed, see what happens. Oh, hey, we have a flag. Or not flag. <laughs> we have a shell as Apache. Beautiful. So as shown in the image above, the exploit works since a reverse shell connection was established. So that's both the uh, authentication bypass that we have going on there, as well as the command injection exploitation, giving us a full reverse shell. That is really cool, and I can see why attackers have been using that. What is the questions we need to answer here? What is the name of the hidden folder located in var dub HTML? Is it just this? What is the content of the flag located in that folder? And there's our flag. All right, and I haven't I haven't even been paying attention to the the chat. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Hello, the stream grind continues. It does wreck this gizmo and it's only going to get more here. I have videos, guys, coming out every single day on my YouTube channel, like in the next couple of days. And then, of course, if you have not seen Avon of Cyber, I released kind of a promo video for it on my YouTube channel. I am doing one of the official walkthroughs for one of the days. I've been doing Evan of Cyber since I really started this journey about three years ago. And my goal is like, I was like, man, I really hope one day I can be one of the people doing the official challenge walkthroughs and this year is the year try me reach out to me and i have the honor of doing that and i will be doing daily live streams every single day in december at 8 p.m central standard time where i will work through the challenges live on the spot and as usual i won't prepare ahead of time it'll be me stumbling my way through it showing silly mistakes being a noob hopefully helping all of us i uh, have imposter syndrome together as we work through the challenges but i do have early access to some of it because of course i had to get my stuff done ahead of time so i have looked at a few of the challenges uh, in particular the ones created by my friend my good friend amoeba man and so i've looked at some of those challenges kind of reviewed the other ones and guys it's going to be a really cool event so if you haven't signed up do it i'm not just saying that i really do think it, it's going to be the best event of cyber so far not only do you have the main thing there's side quests that are like extra challenges i'm excited so if you haven't already guys check out event of cyber it's going to be a fun time Okay, now we're going to switch over to blue team, which is not what I do. I do pen testing, so let's learn some blue team stuff. Identifying indicators of compromise in a system. We've learned in a previous task while breaking down CVE that the HTTP GET request to trigger both authentication bypass and command injection uh, makes use of the following. And we know that because when we are looking at our GET request, we have to do that for the authentication bypass. That would be a good thing to look for. So we know our request endpoint is remoteagent.php, and we know our URL string and parameters. The existence of recognized indicators of compromise in a system typically indicates a security breach or an attempted exploitation. Proper logging is essential as it records all system activities. These records can then be analyzed to confirm the system's regular functions and security remain intact and uncompromised. So log analysis of events generated by this CVE. Proper logging is essential as it records all system activities. These records can then be analyzed to confirm the system's regular functions and security remain intact and uncompromised. Logs often provide information as a breadcrumb trail of user and system activities. In the context of vulnerabilities, they can capture the footprints of av adversaries, of course. Which, guys, I will just say, I have done a little bit of the sock path on Try Hack Me. Really good resource. If you haven't checked it out, uh, do it. Maybe we'll do some of it on stream. I think I'm 40 or 50% of the way through it. I'd have to double check. Hence, analyzing Apache logs can be a potent method to discern if a web server has been targeted by a specific vuln, in this case, this CVE. So let's dive into how this information can be extracted from logs using the grep command. So of course, we need to locate our Apache logs, which I actually need to uh, 
SSH into the server. I mean, I suppose we could switch back over to the attack box now. Let's just do that. Let's go back over to how we were originally doing this on the attack box. I don't think it will bug out since I'm also on the VPN. Yep, we still have a connection. Beautiful. So we'll just switch back over to the attack box. Let's uh, refresh our page so it has all the correct things in here. There we go. Picking right back up where we left off, but on the attack box. So depending on the OS, the location of Apache logs may differ. For Debian and Ubuntu, they're typically stored here. Oh, maybe it's in a different spot on these. Yeah, it must be in a different spot. For CentOS and Red Hat Linux, it would be var log HTTP. There we go. Maybe if I just read ahead, that would be a good starting point. All right, search for suspicious patterns. Exploits leave patterns, specific sequences of actions or requests that don't align with regular user behavior. A list of IOCs can help identify these patterns to create a search query showing and indicating exploitation activity, i.e. searching for activity related to remote agent.php with grep. We can also search for logs at the date or time of exploitation. For example, this command, and you can see what we're doing is we're just grepping for that specific date in our access log, it can be used to search for logs and any indicators of compromise around July 20th. And we can go ahead and do that. And I'll link and copy it. I always think it's good to type it to build that muscle memory. And we're already here, so we'll just do access log. And we have nothing, we have nothing there. We could do today though. And look at that, that's all the exploitations from today when we were working on this. So we can see uh, that clear stuff going on there. That's my phone going off. Oh, reporting. <laughs> it's for work, but I don't work on Saturdays. I have it in my calendar when I do pen tests to always report at 4 p.m. A lot of pen testers wait till the last day to do the whole report. That's overwhelming. So I always hack uh, during my day job till 4 p.m. and I go from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. It's always working on my report. So when it comes to reporting day, everything's nice and peaceful and ready for the client. That's why my phone was going off. And a good career tip for those of you who want to get into pen testing. Do that. It's a lot less stressful than waiting to do your part till the last day of the assessment. Additional arguments with grep can be found by running man grep and the sock path. I think, I think it's a sock two path, probably the sock path as well has a uh, really good stuff on grep and grepping through logs. Review the results as always, or always interpret the results with a discerning eye, check for unfamiliar IPs, unusual user agents and strange request methods and take necessary action. Act swiftly upon uncovering any signs of malicious activity, including blocking certain IPs, patching vulns, or even temporarily taking systems offline for a deeper investigation. Generating alerts with Suricata, I can't say that. Automated alert systems like Suricata, Cata, whatever, can be instrumental in providing real-time alerts for suspicious activities. This can help enhance the vigilance of professionals such as security analysts and security engineers who use these tools. For this, a specific rule can be set up to flag potential exploitation attempts based on the Sigma rule described in Task 5. So below is a Seracuda, Cuda, whatever, alert rule designed to detect this attempt. All right. So we have, we want you to do an alert on HTTP on any of this stuff, right? Home net, any, and here's the message is going to tell us, Hey, there was this exploitation attempt, the content get, if it's doing a get request, remote agent.php on action, pull data, polar ID. And if we see, of course, this in there, PowerShell would be Windows, of course. Then we hey, we know, hey, if we see this going on, we need an alert. Exploitation is happening. We need to stop it as soon as possible. So we can add this to our target machine. So we'll do nano. Should there be other rules in here? Maybe not. Just cat, make sure it went in there properly. 
Yep, it's there. Cool. Update the configuration. So we can edit the main configuration file to change the default rule path and include the new rule. Let's see. Locate the rule file section. Uh, so control W if you're in nano allows you to search. So if you're on what I just did, control W pulls up the search then and then we can actually just type what we're looking for. And we have the default rule path right there. So then we're just gonna add a rule file it looks like. Like that. Does it have to be first, I guess? I don't know if it does, but we'll add it first. Cacti exploit.rules. Save it. And now we'll go ahead and restart it. We don't have to do, oh yeah, we do have to do sudo. We're not root here. Thinking of the attack box. CTL restart like that. Give that a second to go. Looking over the chat, Somnatic said of on three out of four AOCs he's worked on, this one's definitely our best one yet, if you may say. Dude, I'm so excited. He did days one and two. Exciting stuff. The, the hype is real. We're just a few days away from saving Christmas. I have my Christmas tie over there. I got my Christmas hat. It's, it's going to be a fun time. Monitoring alerts. So alerts to var log by default. Monitoring this log file for alerts related to this rule we just created. So we're just doing a tail command. And now we want to re-exploit from our attack box. So we're going to do our parrot machine because that's where I did the exploit originally. And then it should should prompt that rule. Here's the exploit, I think. All right. I'm not seeing any alerts. What did I do wrong? <laughs> I'm too, oh, oh, nope, no, it's still not there. I'm apparently just too good of a hacker and I can't even catch myself hacking it. What step did I miss, guys? Let's see if we can figure it out. We have our cacti exploit rules. I did that. Right, I created that file. We updated the configuration. We have our default rule path. Oh, I see what I did wrong. You guys catch that? Our default rule path, I didn't actually update the path. Let's do that again. I bet that'll fix it now. Now if we tail it. Let's see what happens. Unless I missed something else as well. If I miss one thing, there's always a chance I missed a bunch of things. Oh, I never restarted it now. Gosh, I'm dumb. <laughs> we have to restart it. Semantic, you'll need to restart it to apply the new changes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I must have made the realization at the same time. Although I know Twitch is a little bit behind. Uh, so let's go ahead and restart the system. Okay. All right, guys. Fingers crossed. 
We're gonna exploit this again. I'm just I'm just gonna take credit that I'm such a good hacker, I can't even detect myself hacking myself. Clearly that's the real problem. Hey. We see that all going on alerting us, like, hey, this is this is going on. If you spot any alerts, it indicates potential exploitation attempts. Review the alerts, identify the source IP address, and consider blocking them at the firewall level or taking the necessary security measures. And we can see our IP right here of our attack box. Well, my parrot box. I have two VMs running with the attack box on my parrot machine. Mastering the art of identifying these IOCs can enable one to proactively detect and defend a cacti setup and other web-based app by ensuring a robust defense against various security threats. What is the source IP of the adversary that successfully exploited the vulnerability last July 20th? You know, I didn't see anything when I looked at July 20th. That's what I was initially looking at. Let's see if I missed something there. Because it would just be grep 20. There's nothing. Or maybe, do they mean 2022? 20, Wouldn't it be in the access log? Anyone know why I may not be seeing this? I'm trying to think of this like a weird time thing. Or do I, am I just supposed to go off the screenshot up here? Oh no, because it's not in the screenshot. What if I do their exact command? Maybe I have a typo. Okay, guys, I'm not crazy. It's not there. Are there any other access logs? Oh, there is another access log for November 20th. I see. So that's maybe that's the issue. It's that one right here. And it's just on that November 20th. Good call. So then what are we getting? Just the IP? which we should be able to essentially grab out the IP, but if we scroll up, we have all these attempts, but this is to the actual Cacti instance from what I can see. I think it's this IP right here. But then, guys, what we could do, do I still have Kato open? If you're like me and you suck at remembering elite hacking stuff, uh, give me a grep command. Use some rejects, yeah. So we could also use Kato in this way. And it's that access log. And it's going to pull all the IPs out from that specific log. So then we could look at, hey, what's our machine IP? What's the IP that might be attacking it? And we can see this IP here. But you can imagine how this would be a little more helpful as we just want to pull IPs or maybe emails out of it using rejects to grep that out. What is a base 64 decoded flag being submitted by this adversary? Which I saw that, I think.
So it's this right here. It's URL encoded. Or we could actually fully URL decode it. And then we'll get the flag out of there. Input and then URL decode. And then we of course have our base 64 value right there. Oh, did I miss something? Doesn't let me control Z. Let's see what I didn't copy properly. Or is it a, oh, that's the command. That's the bash. That's reverse shell command. So I don't think that'd even be the flag. What is the basic for Dakota flag being submitted by the adversary? Well, I mean, maybe that would be the flag. Yeah, no, this is just the reverse shell going through. So there is a flag somewhere in there as well. So we're doing the get cacti, get cacti remote agent. That's all the exploit going on. Let's see if we can grep that out of there. I may also be way overthinking this too. Cato closed on me? Don't know if this will work or not. What up, Zach? Good to have you here, my friend. That's not working. We have this right here. Guys, someone tell me, what's the easy way to do this? <laughs> Should I just look through the access log and find the base 64 encoded flag? Maybe I'm once again over complimenting it, over complicating it, I should say. We could do like nano. Control W, base 64. Is this the flag? That's not a base 64 string. The frick, what am I doing wrong? Shouldn't not take me this long to do a guided room. My goodness. Not try hack me fault, it's my fault. I'm doing something dumb here. 
I guarantee you this is way easier than what I'm making it to be. Semantic said, I don't think you're looking for the flag in the access logs. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I was, I, since we were answering log questions, I just assumed that like the flag was in the log. Like we had to pull the base 64 string out of the log and decode it. That makes sense. If it was actually something they uploaded once they got that remote uh, or that uh, reverse shell. Let's see. Okay, what's up to pseudo? I can't check that folder. Var w. Yo, I'm about to elevate my privileges on this machine so I can be a root. <laughs> oh no, they have it pretty locked down on what I can and cannot do as the root user. So it must not be there. Good call. Let's try that. We already got this flag. Guys, I don't know what flag it's looking for. We already got this flag. Yeah, there is, but that was our original flag that we got. That was the flag for this previous step. Um, This flag right here. This, guys, this must be the log still, I think. What, what obvious thing am I missing? Can't believe I'm stuck on a guided room right now. No, let's do maybe if I have full GUI access it'll it'll be a little bit easier. If it's gonna load. Oh, do you, I wonder if it's the directory itself that's base 64 encoded. Um, Come on. Oh, fine. Nope. 
It must be in the logs, guys. So now we have the full log file. Let's see if there was some flag submitted here. We have the reverse shell. Jeez, my eyes are gonna bleed. Why is a word wrap not on by default? I don't know how to turn on a mouse pad. Guys, we're overcomplicating this. What the frick is the answer? We have all this, but I already base 64 decoded that. And that was just the shell, not a flag. I can't keep looking at these log files. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna give up pretty soon. It shouldn't be that difficult. I've already exploited the stupid thing. I don't I I I really don't know what I'm looking for. Oh, it had flag in the log. Guys, this is going to drive me crazy. Where is this at? Where's my other terminal? What? What the? F why did? Why did it just close it? Oh my goodness! Don't freaking close it! I'm gonna lose my mind, guys. I can't do hotkeys.
Is this the flag? I found it. There it is. Wow. <laughs> I think we made that way more difficult than it needed to do, but hey, in the end, in the end, we got the flag. What is the value of the default path rule that must be replaced with Etsy? Uh, I don't remember what it was. I don't, I don't remember when I was looking at that. Like, I replaced it. I didn't check what it was after I replaced it. Do you guys remember what that was? I think it's that. Yeah, cool. All right, <laughs> we're back in business. <laughs> After like nearly rage quitting at least 15 times. All right, using the known indicators we identified after breaking down the vuln, let's showcase how it can be used to hunt for events ingested in a sim, or a seam, or a sim, whatever you want to call it. Investigating events through Kibana. First access the instance here within your attack box browser. At an hour so I don't expire the machine. I'll go back to full screen here. It looks a little bit nicer. Once you have opened it, navigate to Discover Council. So we just have to let it load a, a bit. Okay, once you open Cabana, navigate to the Discover Console by clicking the left sidebar, Highlight 1. In this new view, we'll use the query string below to hunt for indicators of this CVE. The query strings hunts for HTTP GET request to the remote agent Dot PHP, which we can see that right here. Moreover, all the strings below should exist in the HTTP query field, so so we don't find false positives. Lastly, the following strings are also checked in the HTTP query field. These strings indicate potential command execution on either a Windows or a Unix machine. You may follow the instructions below in configuring the Discover view. So set the time frame to July 19th, 2023. Uh, I don't, oh, I can just do here. Okay. Ensure the query is under the file beat index. Okay. Copy the last query into the search field and press enter. And let's see if this loads. Once the query is loaded, you can see that the following, the resulting view provided the logs related to the exploitation of the CVE. To improve this view, add the following fields as a column by navigating to the left sidebar. Source IP, URL path, and URL query. So we're still loading. All right. Okay, so far so good. So we want to add source IP URL path and URL query. We'll do it source IP first. Add. URL path, add. URL query, add. Okay. 
Based on the results, it can be observed that the query was success has successfully provided all events generated by the attack that occurred on July 19th. You may also see that the source IP column reflects the IP address of the attacker, which we can see that right here. Moreover, the URL query column shows all malicious commands injected in the polar ID parameter. Okay. To complete the investigation, replace the query time frame to hunt all attacks generated on July 20th, which I already kind of did. <coughs> you should have a similar view as the image below. So we'll change this to 2330 though. I don't know if that will add any more events. I think we had most of them, but we'll see. What field handled the value remote agent PHP in the elastic query string? URL path, right? Or what field in the string? URL original, I think is what it's looking for. Excluding the local host IPs, what is the source IP of the adversary that exploded the vulnerability at last July? That right there. No? That's definitely the IP, isn't it? Guys, this is the only IP here. What is it looking for? Oh. Oh, that may be the actual IP of the the server itself. No? Dude, what is it looking for? What am I missing, guys? These are the only IPs in source IP. Oh, July 20th. Good call. It's the small details that matter, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I stream, so you guys can help me with my Newbery. All right, so it means minus this one, what's the IP? Well, then we can see it pretty clearly right there. Excluding entries from the local host IPs, what is the encoded base 64 string used by the attacker during the exploitation attempt? So that's this right here. Can I, uh, is there a way to pull this out? Maybe if I do URL query, can I copy it? No. can't copy that whole field that's a little bit silly let's see if that copies oh it does all right what is the encoded base 64 string used by the attacker let's just pull this into cyber chef again do they want the actual encoded string then they don't want it decoded they just want the encoded string so they just want this No, they don't just want that. They want it decoded. That has spaces in it though. There's no spaces in the answer. This is the this is the string. Either I'm dumb or these quite I don't like the way these questions are worded. Excluding entries from the local host IP. Oh, that's the local host IP. Gosh, I am freaking dumb. <laughs> so can we exclude? Will that remove it completely?
and then can we sort it based on that IP? I think I did it right that time. So it's looking for this value right here, I think. Yeah. Almost done, guys. Struggle busting my way through this, but I'm learning. Managing third-party software like Cacti can pose significant challenges for large organizations. With the complexities of scale, diverse software, and compliance requirements, patch management is vital to effectively handle the patching process and ensure the security and stability of third-party applications within the org's IT infrastructure. Patch management. So patch management is the typical course of action to address issues related to known vulnerable software. It typically involves the following steps. So we have patch identification, monitoring various sources such as software vendors, security advisories, vulnerability databases, etc., etc. Patch assessment, assessing the relevance and criticality of each patch to determine if it's necessary for the specific environment or system. This often requires working with like the project experts in your org. This is actually what I did before I became a pen tester. I did patch management for a uh, large bank financial institution, which honestly just meant a lot of meetings. Patch testing, a testing patches in a controlled environment, such as a test network or subset of systems to ensure they do not introduce new issues or conflicts with existing software and configurations. Like this is huge. Often people get a pen test and they just think, hey, just patch everything. You won't have any security issues. Guys, if you've never worked in a large organization, a lot easier said than done. One patch could break a bunch of mission critical things. So you really have to work with the business and understand business risk and, and what is going on here. Uh, patch deployment, deploy approved patches, usually through a change of management system, which once again just takes forever, uh, to the target system or network infrastructure following a plan scheduled or urgency, considering any dependencies or prerequisites. The way we had to do this is I had to submit my change, uh, the, the systems it was going to affect, the exact steps I was going to use, like the bailout method. Basically, if it doesn't work, how can I return it back to the previous thing? Here's a time window I'm doing. And then it would have to go through a change control board. I'd have to answer questions by the change control board. And only then could I deploy the patch. So once again, if you've never worked at that like large of an organization, there's so much more than just like, hey, patch your stuff. It is a process. Patch verification, verifying the successful patch installation and conducting post deployment testing to ensure the desired results are achieved and that the system remains stable and secure. And patch monitoring and maintenance, continuously monitoring for new patches and updates, staying informed about emerging threats and maintaining an ongoing patch management process and watching Tyler struggle his way through CVEs. I forgot to include that on here, but that's definitely something you should do. By implementing patch management, emerging vulnerabilities on third-party apps can be proactively addressed and threats can be easily prevented. While patch management aids in the process of mitigating software vulns, it is also essential to understand directly the fixes applied to a software app. Given this, let's proceed to the next section. So vulnerable code mitigation. As a response of Cacti developers to the vulnerability, a patch was immediately released in version 1.2.3. The fix has prevented the authentication bypass and command injection vulns on the remote agent endpoint. To expound further, let's discuss the changes made to the source code. The source code of Cacti is hosted on GitHub, so we can easily view the commits done during the patch application. For a quick resource, you may use this link to see the essential changes made on the vulnerable website. Or vulnerable endpoint, I should say. Okay, the first one in line 301, which contains this, there's an end filter, remember, allowing strings. The next, next in line 385, which contains the following code, and you can see what we did here is they took it out so that you can't add the strings. In 385, we have this code, which was like, hey, any of that had that path PHP binary stuff, you're able to do the RCE. They're doing the cacti escape the shell argument to stop that from happening. And lastly, in lines 446 and 447, config polar ID, config polar ID, we're once again escaping it. So we're not just taking user input, we're escaping anything that might be dangerous. The first fix on line 301 is about replacing the git, which we understood. And the git and filter allows arbitrary strings, which are the same value, right? That was the issue and that's what we recognized and they fixed that. That makes sense. Moving on to the remaining fixes, we can see those variables which we just looked at together. They're using the cacti escape shell argument function. Based on the source code, it can be seen on that. And it uses the escape shell arg built in PHP function to wrap the argument in a single string via single quotes, preventing potential command injection attempts. 
Lastly, the patch for the authentication bypass was implemented on the git client address function of library functions PHP, as shown in the patch difference. It can be seen that the usage of custom HTTP headers was removed. Is this the... Uh, let's, let's look at this real quick. So the red is what's been removed. You can see all of these headers. And you're no longer able to do that. So the, the attacker cannot set their own headers to bypass that. Only the remote address variable is used by default. To maintain the application's functionality, the apply fix allows admins to configure what HTTP proxy headers are acknowledged when determining the client IP. All right, based on the patch, what is the function used to restrict the input on the polar ID parameter to integers only? It's just this, right? Based on the patch, what is the function used to sanitize strings, which helps in preventing command injection? That's that cacti shell escape argument stuff that we saw. And based on the patch, what is the function that was modified to prevent the authentication bypass? It was the git client address function, stopping attackers from being able to use like an X forwarded four header to modify that. Finally, the conclusion, congratulations, we have completed the cactus room. Guys, that was harder for me than a lot of like the boot to root CTFs. I got hung up on a few of those parts, but that was actually a lot of uh, fun. So kudos to try hack me, kudos to the creators of the machine. I learned a lot through that. What I really enjoyed was it not only taught you how to exploit it, it also taught you how to detect it, and it also taught us a little bit of code review using GitHub to look at things that changed and things that were modified, and then we had actually go through and identify the functions that were modified. Really, really fun. Good work on the try hack me side of things. So we have completed it. We have learned the following, what the CVE is and about its impact on Cacti users, the breakdown of the vuln from authentication bypass, chaining it to a code execution vuln, different ways to hunt and detect the exploitation of the vulnerability, and you know, learning how to control F for flags rep for flags, how to effectively maintain and mitigate threats to third-party applications. If you enjoyed this room, check these out. I think I've done all of those. I enjoyed the room. What if you didn't enjoy it? Then you can't complete it because then you can't mark that off or else you're lying. But we, we did enjoy it. And uh, we have completed it. Guys, it has been an hour and a half, and I think we'll probably stop the stream and the recording here fun working through cactus and, and learning about code review and bypass authentication and rce really a lot of fun stuff so uh let me just remind you stay tuned to my youtube channel youtube is my main platform so if you are not subscribed to me on youtube go do it now just go to youtube.com and look for tyler ramsby you'll find my material you'll find my content i have videos coming out recently almost every single day working through different machines explaining different concepts stumbling my way through things like this stream today so make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and check out those videos coming up in the upcoming days and finally if you have not seen my promo my commercial one more reminder Avenue of Cyber, I'm doing one of the official challenge rooms, but I will also be daily live streaming every single day at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, working together on Saving Christmas. So make sure you join me for Avenue of Cyber as well. I don't think I'll be live streaming until then. I only say that because with the all the streaming I've been doing, I already have videos, like I said, coming out every single day up until December 1st. And then of course, December 1st, I'll be streaming every single day throughout the month of December as we celebrate, or not celebrate, but rescue Christmas, save Christmas. So I don't know that for sure, but I probably won't be on live stream. We'll see if I get bored and jump on anyways. But guys, thank you for being here. Go to my YouTube channel to find all the videos coming up the next few days and come back to my live stream on December 1st as we work on saving Christmas together. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. I will catch you in the next one. See ya.